Okay. Um, so welcome everyone for joining our panel discussion on civil disobedience in Myanmar today. My name is Francesca Chiu. I'm a PhD researcher at International uh, Development at the University of East Anglia. Today, we are very honored to have four pan uh, panelists to join us. And before we get to introduce our panelists and start our discussion, I would like to give you a very overview of what is happening in Myanmar these days. Let me share my screen. So last November, the Aung San Suu Kyi-led National League for Democracy, the NLD, won by a landslide in the most recent January election. But the country's military claimed the election results were fraudulent, and on February 1st, the military detained Suu Kyi and President Win Mint in the country's first coup since 1988, bringing an end to a decade of political transition towards democratization. Since February 1st, non-stop protests against the military and the coup have blanketed Myanmar. They have come in different forms, such as residents hitting pots and pans on the street, labor strikes, a military boycott campaign, and citizens taking to the streets. There are also silent strikes where citizens stayed indoor despite the military asking people to go out to act normal. Over 700 civilians have lost their lives in the course of this resistance, and many are being arrested and charged by the military under the newly amended penal code, which has created new offenses and expanded existing offenses to target those speaking critically of the coup and the military, along with those participating in the civil disobedience movement. In short, people continue to refuse to accept the coup or to recognize the military and its government. Earlier this month, the NLD established a national unity government to continue fighting against the military. Against this backdrop of ongoing resistance, today in our discussion, we would like to particularly focus on two segments, youth groups and ethnic groups. We will discuss their roles, struggles, views, and their involvement in the resistance movement. And in order to gain more insight into these groups, we've invited activists and researchers from both to join us today. And let me give you all an overview of our panelists. And at first, let me stop sharing. At uh, first, we have Alex Ankant. Alex is a member of the NLD and he served as the program head for the Central Research Committee of the NLD and before the coup. He also ran in the Yangon municipal elections back in 2019. Ahead of the recent ASEAN summit, Alex wrote for Time magazine urging ASEAN leaders to respect the will of the people in Myanmar and reject the military. I've provided a link to his Time magazine, uh, to his Time article in a checkbox right now. Um, second, I would like to introduce Nam Baba Pan. Baba is one of the founders of Pan Foundation, an NGO focused on human rights advocacy, cultural preservation, education, and alleviation of poverty in the state of Quran, Myanmar. You can also, I will also provide a link to the foundation in the chat later. Third, we have Ying Lao, a, po a policy analyst who has provided advice and technical support to youth and women's organizations, political parties, and ethnic armed groups since 2015. She has also participated in Myanmar Federalism Leadership Program, and she was one of the few female representatives of on the Federal Constitution Drafting and Coordinating Committee back in 2007. Federal democracy is a key topic that we will discuss later in this seminar. And lastly, we have Dr. Kristen McConaughey, an associate professor in law at UEA. Her research focuses on refugee issues in Myanmar. Kristen has written extensively on displacement, the governance of forced migration and transnational justice. 
And here, I would like to thank Alex, Bavua, Ying Lao, and Kristin for taking the time and meet their BC schedules to join this panel discussion today. I would also like to thank Lucas from the School of International Development for his technical support and Saifu Xingong for helping with the logistics. For our program today, we will have the panel discussion for an hour. And for the last 30 minutes, we will open the floor for Q&A. You can post your questions with your name and affiliation in the Q&A box anytime during the discussion. So, all right, without, now without any further ado, let's get started. So first, I would like to discuss youth participation in the resistance. And Alex, you are a young politician and young activist in Myanmar, and you are also a Generation Z yourself. So can you give our audience an overview of what roles our younger protesters are playing in the movement, of what does it mean to them, and how do they view their resistance differently from their older peers? Thank you, Francesca, for that introduction, and welcome to all my co-panelists. First, I would like to start by giving out a strong message of encouragement for all our countrymen and women back in Myanmar fighting for our freedoms and democracy uh, against the violence of military oppression. And uh, the same goes for all the people who have uh, the suffered and, uh, and, and been killed as well. This coup is uh, unlike the ones that we have had in our past. A lot of the researchers and uh, scholars have always pointed out how you know, Burma has not uh, has endured several coups before, and that is true. Our dictatorship extends uh, all the way to General Ne Win, arguably, and uh, and it has been continued ever since. And so, even the ten years of partial democracy that we enjoyed, uh, quote unquote, is very much uh, not a full democracy, and we were all very aware of that. Of course, the world famously knows our twenty five percent. Uh, occupation of military members in every parliament, uh, including national. And so this is uh, one of the hard concrete proofs. Uh, but this protest this time around and this movement, <clears throat> especially led by a young uh, generation is simply because first of all, the older generations have more or less all been arrested. Um, they were all arrested on the fir very first day, that includes not just national leaders, but also regional leaders. And from Yangon myself, I can say that uh, the current ethnic minister, for example, Don Noban Tenzamyo, was arrested on the 1st of February. And so the military was very strategic in planning out uh, the arrest of all the, what we so call the legacy leaders. Of course, some legacy leaders such as Minko Nine have escaped this arrest so far, but this opened up a channel and this opened up a need for young people to rise up to the challenge to protect our democracies. And so first of all, the biggest um, factor that led the, the young protesters from joining this movement, unlike other coups that we have had, is number one is the internet and social media, which is arguably uh, the tool and the biggest tool we have in connecting ourselves. So we have a population that is globally connected uh, to what is happening around the, the, the world. And, um, and so from that also, we are aware of the threats to our democracy and the threats in the region faced by other countries such as Hong Kong and Thailand, who also underwent uh, protests. Uh, and number two is we are mobilized because we have internet and because we are all connected, we can mobilize each other to go protest. So it is not just Yangon or it's not just Mandalay, but also smaller and other cities, many other cities and smaller towns uh, rising up and sharing that information. So we really felt solidarity as a country, as a people, not just as an ethnic group or a party member, we really felt solidarity that this decision affected the whole country. And the second is uh, we are also a country and a youth, a younger generation that is first mostly enjoyed 10 years of uh, greater freedoms than military occupation. We, we were in 10 years into the transition movement. And so these are people who have largely voted maybe once, maybe twice. Uh, or maybe even three times if you count uh, smaller local and by-elections, uh, that depends. And so these are people who, have, who know and who like the process that we were on. 
Um, and fourth is we were also a generation that is more, much more international and foreign educated uh, than before. We are aspiring and we are much more uh, open to global views, which makes us more dynamic and innovative. And, and I talk about innovation a lot because, you know, continuing on the protest, we didn't just protest in one way, we have protested in many ways. We have sound protests, you know, just on Easter, you know, three weeks ago for the 4th of April, we protested with eggs, you know, so the uh, innovation of our, of our movement is uh, very high. And uh, a couple last points just before I finish my part is that we, we still have our leaders that we look up to. In 1988, we were trying to find leaders and 1988 was really, the birth of many of our contemporary leaders uh, in politics. But now we have leaders, not just older leaders, but also younger leaders. You know, Kowe Monain, who has been arrested and brutally tortured, he is one such leader. Kote Zasan from Mandalay has become an iconic figure in the protest. Uh, and so these are youth that are exposed to politics, that are used to working in NGOs and working for civil society groups. And uh, lastly, uh, this is a very important point is this protest is also um, uh, sparked because people have already faced one year under COVID. And, uh, and so we are already very aware of the economic effects of our country. And so uh, this resistance is uh, very much different from our older peers. Thank you, Alex, for the sharing. And um, as you have mentioned, this new generation of resistance is quite different from what we've seen before and back in 1962 or 1988 because of, like you said, the use of the internet and the social media and also this generation is more mobilized and they have already experienced the 10 years of transitions. And so I would like to ask questions to Ying Lao and Bua Bua because both of you have worked a lot on youth uh, issues and and with your organizations as well. So I would like to ask you, um, what roles do youth play in the ethnic groups organizations in particular? And is the situation Alex just described for younger protesters roles in the movement similar to what you can see within ethnic groups organizations? Um, would Baba like to start first? Thank you, thank you. Um, throughout Burma history, uh, youth played a very crucial role and uh, I think um, they are youth are very determined and creative. And I, uh, this, I think this time it's different as the technology and everything. And um, <clears throat> you can see like Alex mentioned, they use their different technique to protest. Like the current youth uh, network in uh, Rangoon, they protest without protesters because of the crackdown is too much. And they have like swimming, uh, like protests, things like that. It's and that is all part of Burma, not just uh, I mean, not just in the central Burma, in all uh, many uh, in many in current state as well in Irrawaddy Delta. So I think uh, this is happening all over Burma. The youth involvement in this uprising, and uh, 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 let me say that because um, this youth, uh, like they have been living under a kind of uh, uh, democracy, let's say, for the last 10 years. So they know how it's like. And um, uh, they won't accept any dictator. They won't accept any kind, any form of dictator, not just military dictator. And they want to make sure that their generation is the last generation to live under dictator, military dictatorship or any, uh, any uh, all form of dictatorship. And that's why they are trying to involve in all sort of way in this uprising. That's what I believe. And that is um, because people in Burma, they are asking for a genuine democracy. We, don't, we do not want to go back to a, a statue quo before the military coup. It will be meaningless for us. So we suffer so much under this military, military dictatorship and uh, we just, can't go back. That's why these youth are trying to do all they can to end this kind of um, uh, uh, dictator. That's why I believe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Wawa. Um, so for Ying Lao, do you have anything to add? I know you've worked extensively in Shan and also advising um, youth organizations there. Do you have a different observation there? Yes, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's very nice to see you all here. Um, 
I just, I think I would like to add a little bit of, um, I mean, a slightly different uh, perspective. When it's come to ethnic youth, uh, particularly those who, uh, who live uh, in the ethnic areas, you know, in the, all these, you know, border states, um, this fight has, this fight is new, not new. This is not new. The fight, the struggles that they face uh, has been ongoing uh, since before. Um, the fact that uh, there have been uh, glimmers of democracy for the past 10 years did not uh, necessarily make their life any easier. Um, in fact, uh, they even face a lot more uh, uh, difficulties, a lot more hardships uh, because of the uh, glimmers of democracy uh, with NLD being in power, a lot of investment coming in and that it caused it, uh, you know, they, subsequently there have been a lot of land grabbing as well as the lack of rule of law has been causing a lot more drugs problems uh, and, and many, many other uh, problems. So for the youth uh, in the ethnic areas, this fight is just a simple continuation of the existing fight that they have been uh, fighting uh, for many, many years. I think uh, um, I dare to say that uh, for as long as they could remember uh, since uh, many of them were born. Um, so this is just uh, you know one perspective that um, uh, I would like to highlight uh, for the uh, young people who are living in the ethnic areas. Um, but uh, at the same time, I also want to want to uh, give a big shout out to the uh, General Strike Committee of Nationalities. Uh, this is the uh, strike committees of this, you know, different uh, 27, 29 different uh, ethnic nationalities uh, got together and really lead the protests uh, in the middle of Yangon, huh? uh, which you also use one of the pictures uh, in, in your brief as well. Um, and if you look at these ethnic youth who live in the city, uh, but also participated in the in this uh, general strike, and this is something that um, I, I would just you know add on to what Alex have just said. Um, in addition to that, I also wanted to you know give a shout out to you know someone like Ethan Zamao, a young woman uh, who is now just newly appointed as a deputy minister of uh, women, youth, and. Uh, children Affairs, um, and he, uh, Esther Zeno, who is an all, also a colleague of Hiden Zamao, uh, the two of them actually started the, 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 the whole protest in Yangon, right, along with all these uh, uh, women uh, who are working in the factories. Um, they are the one who actually started the protest on the 6th, uh, on February 6th, right, in Yangon. And um, these are the young women and these kind of create uh, a situation have created a lot more, you know, generation of leaders and we are uh, extremely uh, lucky to have them. I think um, this is also an uh, opportunity for us to look at the new face of the, the country, a new chapter for the country, uh, not only, you know, uh, it is important that we recognize the, the sacrifice and the leaderships of the old leaders, but at the same time, we also uh, are not focusing too much on the old leaders and actually give way to the new generation of uh, leaders. Thank you, Yingle, for your input. And um, since we are all talking about ethnic groups and their participation, and I think one of the key features of this movement is how it is give a chance for different ethnic groups to unite together to fight against the military and the coup. And for that, I would like to ask Kristen a question. So um, what are the most important differences that you can see between now and when the resistance begin, especially in relation to the strategies ethnic groups have been using to resist the military? Thanks, Francesca. Yeah, I mean, I think, um... It's a really important question about the changing position of ethnic groups. And I think my comments probably echo and, and continue Ying Lao's because I suppose what we've seen since the start of the coup, it's really made me realize first what has been gained in the last 10 years and what might be lost, but also just how unequal those gains have been over the past 10 years. And, and the fact that as Ying Lao is saying, there are areas which not only did not see things improve, but actually, uh, found themselves in worse conditions and perhaps with less international awareness and sympathy. And so I think this inequality of, of benefiting from transition is something that's um, quite important. And for years, really, it's been very frustrating for me to see this conversation about transition in Burma, 
which has really excluded so much of the ethnic areas and the ethnic nationality experience so that we've had this very thin understanding of transition and change where a lot of the ethnic nationality demands haven't been part of the mainstream conversation and that's been um i think that's the biggest change that i see in the past few months that for the the devastating consequences of the coup are so really showing how much can be lost and how much people really were benefiting so i'm not trying to suggest that you know there's anything good about the coup except that we can start to have a more inclusive conversation perhaps and i think there is now more awareness of the brutality of the military and more awareness of perhaps what some of the ethnic areas have been enduring for so long and hopefully now I think a greater awareness of the need to bring in those demands and, and recognize ethnic communities going forwards. And I think if that happens, then when the military is defeated, actually there's a really positive potential vision that can come out of this that might be um, perhaps more inclusive. So this is maybe an area where I actually feel there's something optimistic that can come out of this in the sense of having a wider conversation about ethnic demands and, and their place in Myanmar, yeah. Thank you, Kirsten, for your input. Since you have brought up the topic about opening dialogues and talking about ethnic issues and there are changing narratives that people, the citizens in Myanmar, they are more open-minded and have more opportunities to talk about different ethnic groups and the discussion of federal democracy, um, for example, we'll discuss later, and the representation uh, in the country. So I would like to ask Ying Lao and Wawa uh, questions about um, based on your understanding and your experience, do you think um, to what extent has the way the Obama ethnic majority treats other ethnic groups changed since the coup? Um, what do you think, uh, why do you think that is? Um, would Baba like to start first? Sure, sure. I think uh, that is uh, what Dr. Kristen says is very true because what happened in our like, ethnic area, it has been totally ignored for uh, like decades. Uh, so, but I what I can tell is the good thing that came out of this coup is the general population of Burma tend to seem to understand a bit more about the situation in uh, our ethnic area. I, I see that because uh, in the past, like we thought we are bad people, uh, like we are rebel. We like that's why we they didn't understand why we took up arms to defend our people. But after this coup. I like a lot of uh, a lot of wise come out. We now understand. Uh, we are sorry and uh, things like that. So for me, like personally, I think it's that is the good part that came out of the the coup that people understand more about ethnic area, ethnic suffering, not just during the coup. It has been for decades, like the beating, the killing, the torture, everything that happening in central Burma, Mandalin, Yangon, it's not just, it's happened in the ethnic areas for all the times, but no one know about it. Now they can feel it, they can see it in social, uh, social media. So that's, um, I think it's a good, one of the good thing. And another thing is, um, if you notice in the beginning of the coup, uh, people are just uh, asking for the release of Aung San Suu Kyi and President Wu, uh, uh, President. But uh, after a while, they are now they are now calling for um, the end of a dictator, the end of two thousand dictatorship, the end of two thousand eight constitution, uh, the restoration of um, uh, federal democracy, and also uh, the release of all political prisoners and detainees and that is the moving of the, the demands at the end so for me i think it's kind of a positive way a positive steps thank you thank you Barbara. Um, and can i ask Ning Lao for your input as well yes i think um how the questions about um does, uh, how the Burma, how you know how does the coup change the Burma ethnic majority threat to or perceive uh, you know ethnic groups? I think uh, that question should also be directed to uh, you know one of our Burma youth, you know Alex Alkan as well. Um, I think he will be able to uh, answer the question more directly, or you know. Um, but um, if we look at it from the social media point of view, in the past, uh, whenever there is a fight between uh, ethnic arms organization and the, the military. Um, uh, the comments would always say, if you don't like the system, if you don't like this country, 
get out of this country, go live somewhere else, go live in Saudi Arabia or somewhere. Um, that is the, the comments. And then the comments would also say like, kill them all, get rid of all of them, right? That is before. But now today, um, the, the sentiments have, has changed or whenever there's a news about uh, uh, the KNU the fight with the military, then the people would cheer for KNU and KIA, you know, all these different arms organization instead of cheering for the, the military. Um, now, um, I would say that um, it is uh, good, but at the same time, I also wanted, uh, want to be, want us to all be very cautious about uh, how this sentiment changed, uh, because uh, if we look at it realistically in the past, uh, we all, um, before NLD got into power, um, we were, the, the sentiment was also similar to right now. Only when NLD was in power, the past five years that sent the sentiments totally change uh, from if you don't want to live in this country, go away, uh, because this country is good and it's moving toward something good. Um, and someone who criticized the system in the past five years was considered as spoiler. <clears throat> And I think uh, right now uh, it is back to before you know the point the, the point in time before the five years ago. Uh, how how long this would last? This change in perception uh, and mentality would last. Uh, we cannot be sure. Uh, this is all due to the signaling of the leadership as well. Um, um, for example, uh, the past five years, uh, the NLD government uh, and the leadership uh, keep uh, insisting on using the terms uh, democracy federal instead of federal democracy. Now that there is a the coup overnight, uh, the remaining NLD leadership switched the word from democracy federal that they have been insisting on using the past five years to dem uh, federal democracy. Um, now, is it a good thing? Yes. Uh, is this something that we should welcome? Yes. Is this something that we should recognize? Yes. But how long will it last? That remains to be seen. Uh, we should not just, you know, jump onto the conclusion that uh, things are really good and, and, and all of this thing. Um, I think um, that, that would be uh, a, a, short, a short version of, of my answer. Of course, uh, you know, uh, there are many uh, that uh, I would like to discuss uh, in, the, in the next round of the questioning. Thank you. Thank you, Ning Lao. Um, I would also like to direct this question to Alex and also Kristen as well, if you would like to have uh, also some input. Is that like, have you seen evidence of a shift in the Burma majority, uh, uh, Burma ethnic majority, the perceptions of changing in terms of how they see ethnic groups in the past few months? And if so, how? Dr. Kirsten, would you like to start first? You go first, Alex. In fact, I think I'll, I've said my comments are probably already enough for this question, so I'll hand to you. I, I echo uh, the two uh, ethnic uh, female leaders that we have had on our panel, and it's a pleasure to hear their word uh, and for the community that is listening as well. Um, I think it's very important because, as you, as you both rightly uh, point out, the Burma uh, ethnic, the majority, has always known about the oppression of bad things. We hear about them all the time. We have just felt far from it. Uh, now I say we, not me personally, but uh, I know of a lot of people who felt that the transition to democracy uh, would take time. And indeed a lot of uh, the criticism at that time was not very welcome because it felt like two groups, one group which was much more patient and obviously not as oppressed as the other group, which was much more oppressed and much more impatient for change because they were uh, as, as, uh, as, as because of their, their uh, ethnic background, they were much more oppressed. Now, we also understand the hesitation for, uh, you know, to regain the ethnic trust. We, we know why the ethnic groups are hesitant to trust uh, the CRPH, for example, right now. And that's uh, very obvious because the decades that they have endured of failed promises uh, is, is very disappointing indeed. And, uh, you know, and Ma um, Ying Long correctly points out how long this would actually last because the education needed is not just for our politicians, but also for our population, where the population itself has to understand that our ethnic uh, 
countrymen are are facing this uh, oppression. Uh, we have indeed seen this vast shift uh, from mentality, you know, before as uh, I was not aware of the comments that uh, Ying Lao had pointed out on on the kinds of you know, angry comments against ethnics, but certainly one of the biggest shifts is when I myself saw uh, student unions formally apologized to the Rohingya community. And we have also seen a union minister uh, who also happens to be Karen, uh, Dor Susanna Lasso, Lasso uh, formally apologized to Rohingyas for having let them down previously before and not understanding the oppression that they faced before because uh, uh, a lot of our ethnic groups honestly felt that we uh, we did not stand by the values that we should have always stood by them uh, and they felt very disappointed and not just disappointed but very hurt uh, and, and and this is a very long uh, trauma that will need a lot of repair certainly now this shift I hope uh, is also uh, evidence of a shift in leadership. Ying Lao said that uh, we have uh, new leaders uh, who now have changed uh, you know, perspectives. That is very true. But when we look at the leadership itself, it is much more diverse than we had in the last five years. It is also much younger and it is certainly not the same uh, what we call the old guards of democracy anymore. This is a much younger and much more diverse and much more aware people. And we could even make a point that these very people in the new CRPH are, uh, have always felt this point of view, but they were just unable to voice out their solidarity for ethnic groups uh, in the last five years because of internal political reasons. Thank you, Alex. Um, so does, does Christian has anything to add on top of Alex and Wawa and Ying Lao just said? No, I think all the comments that have been said, um, you know, have been very insightful. So I will leave it, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Christian. Um, for the discussion here, we are talking about how the resistant movement has given opportunity for different ethnic groups to form alliances within the country. And so for my next question, I would like to talk about the alliance a little bit broader beyond Myanmar. So we have seen alliances form between different civilian-led groups in the region um, that with the help of the social media and the internet. And those groups are usually led by young activists in their countries. So I would like to ask Alex about this question. What are you and other young activists hoping to achieve by reaching out to people in other countries? For example, through the appeals of the so-called Milk Tea Alliance. Thank you. Um, first of all, this, uh sort of alliance in the region started because before our own coup, we saw oppression uh, in mainly Hong Kong and Thailand. We saw protest movements there. Uh, you know, we thought they were oppressed, but now we are certainly a lot more oppressed than them. Uh, and so we were quite, uh, quite alarmed that this became a regional issue. And the main you know, point behind this was first of all, we are a Southeast Asian country, uh, which is largely you know, uh, connected. And certainly we wish ASEAN could play a bigger role. And I think that is reflected in the article that you have shared uh, that I wrote. Um, but the other issue is also, you know, the, the other factors behind it is that first of all, we, we consider them to be friends. You know, Most of our young population have traveled to these countries. They have friends there that also probably have shared history of of protests where they were protesting last year and you know they had they faced these issues and so we felt solidarity from the beginning the second uh, factor is the involvement of china and uh, that is one of the uh, that is probably the biggest factor uh, that is to be considered because this is a regional issue that you know we see the inaction of china and the interference of china in these political issues. Now, China often plays the role of big uh, brother to the ASEAN community, where it considers itself the paupo uh, of the region, you know, and so, but instead of being the big brother, we see that it is actually being the big bully and uh, preventing uh, action and international action from happening uh, uh, to 
these uh, oppression movements. And certainly it, it, it itself is accused of oppression to its own people in Hong Kong, for example. Um, and so with Myanmar, the Milk Tea Alliance started as this movement where we recognize we have the same patterns and we have the same struggles for democracy, for freedom, for uh, a lot more tolerance and for um, the types of democracy that we would like. Um, and there's a lot more issues, obviously, a, a younger generation as well. Um, and so this, to me, this alliance is, you know, and a lot of people can interpret it many ways, but to me, number one is that we have shared recognition between the struggles of our ASEAN uh, friends, where we see that we, they have the shared struggle as us. And the second is publicity, where we also want the world to recognize us for this uh, same struggle that is going not just in, you know, that is happening not just in our country, but in other countries. And so this is really an alarm to the international community. And the third is really that point that this alliance signals the world that, hey, there's been inaction in this region and it's been going on for far too long. You know, how long do we have to fight for democracy? You know, we've had since the end of the Second World War, we've been going on uh, on this journey that has seen multiple setbacks and multiple, uh, you know, that has costed many lives. And so this Milk Tea Alliance is really a, a solidarity movement for the world to recognize us and to help us. Thank you, Alex. And I agree that um, we can see a lot, for example, on Twitter and also on Instagram, there are a lot of poses and, and also cartoons and artwork shared between different artists in different countries in the region, sharing the same solidarity and forming the alliance that you've talked about. And this kind of informal alliances, civilian-led movement is also keeping the momentum going on top of what is happening officially, because officially we know of you know the abolishment of 2008 constitutions and the forming of the NUG that we were going to talk about now, and on top of the all the official movement, we do also need civilian to take part in their role in forming the alliances so that the movement can continue going on. And for that, I would also like to move our next topic to the national unity government that is recently formed by NLD and also to the future of um, federal democracy. And for that, I would like to start with Gua Gua first. Um, the national unity government has been praised for its diversity and relatively speaking, it seems to be more inclusive. Uh, for example, the NLD government has brought more Quran members on board than previous administrations. And as a Quran yourself, how do you view this change? And are we getting closer to federal democracy and in which the different ethnic groups they can enjoy equal rights and shares and representation in a country? Baba. Thank you, thank you. It's a very important uh, question. Um, the formation of NUG is just a small step toward political solution. It is just an um, interim government. Uh, we do welcome more ethnic inclusion and it's a positive step. However, we still have a long way to go toward a genuine federal democracy. We need to see the inclusion of ethnic political organizations as well as ethnic political parties. And we need to see the recognition of existing ethnic um, administration or governance because uh, we all, we, I think, most of the ethnic group, we have our structure already. We just need NUG to uh, support it. Uh, the most important thing is we want to see Burma where everyone is treated equally with fairness and dignity and with uh, human rights, regardless of our race, our ethnicity, our religion, our gender, and our political background. Um, under the NLG government, um, they see Burma as a Burman Buddhist country only. But for us, Burma is a very diverse country with different cultures, different traditions, languages, which should be protected and respected and appreciated. So um, uh, that's for all for now from me. Thank you, Wa Wa. And I would like to ask my next question to Ying Lao uh, when we are talking about the NUG government. So uh, one of the criticisms of the NUG is that there are no Shan members. 
and there are also no right kind for that matter. And in Lao, as you're Ashan yourself, how do you view the national unity government's approach to building a more inclusive coalition? In Lao. Sorry. Um, this, this question is a little bit complex to answer. It is not, uh, you know, um, you, it cannot be answered with a very simple question. So I was, I probably need to take a little bit of time to, to talk to discuss about this question. Uh, first of all, um, what I'm about to say, uh, I do not speak on behalf of the Shan or the Rakhine. Um, I, I will be speaking as, uh, as someone who is observing this process very closely and as, uh, as an analyst. Um, the, the first thing, the first thing I wanted to point out to 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 all our audience is that NUG was not formed by NLD. Okay, uh, it was formed by the the CRPH, the committee representing the Thang Su Lo Even though the the com, um, the compositions of the CRPH itself, it may be dominated by the the NLD, uh, but uh, uh, it was formed by the CRPH you know, committee representing Bithang uh, Sulotong in consultation with NUCC. This is my first point, my first point of criticisms. NUCC, National Unity uh, Consultative Council. Um, due to the nature of the CRPH, uh, it does not, um, it is not able to accommodate all these different uh, stakeholders, we would say. Now, CRPH may be uh, elected uh, or, or you know, electorally legitimate body. Uh, however, legitimacies come in many shape and form. Uh, I think this is also recognized by CRPH uh, in a way. Uh, this is the reason why you know, as soon as uh, yeah, CRPH was formed, uh, they reach out to all these different uh, ethnic uh, organizations, political parties, as well as arms organizations, and also you know, the protest leaders, you know, the, all these different general strike committees. Um, this is the reason why uh, the national unity gov government was not uh, simply formed by the CRPH, but instead it was formed by CRPH in consultation with NUCC in order to be able to accommodate uh, the, all these different diverse group and all these different uh, groups with uh, all, uh, all shape and forms of legitimacy. Uh, to promote uh, inclusiveness and as well as the uh, uh, collective leadership, uh, which is uh, mentioned in the Federal Democracy Charter uh, 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 issued by the uh, CRPH, uh, I think uh, at the end of uh, March, no, on March 31st. Now, um, the issue, the, the first issue is, uh, even though uh, the national unity government was formed by national uh, uh, CRPH in consultation with NUCC, National Unity Consultative Council. Up until now, we still don't know who are part of National Unity Consultative Council. And um, one of our, you know, uh, the, the old gods, uh, if I may borrow, borrow the words uh, by, uh, used by Alex, um, uh, Mingo Nai uh, spoke uh, on behalf of the National Unity Consultative Council. Uh, to announce the appointment of uh, the ministers and then to announce the formation of national unity government. However, we still don't know who are the national consultative, uh, national unity consultative council. So this is number one. Um, as far as I found out, uh, it has not been properly formed yet, and it is not clear what the role and responsibility of National Unity Consultative Council are, uh, uh, and, and how would this council uh, interact uh, with the CRPH as well as uh, National Unity uh, Government, it's unclear. So this is the first point. Um, the second point is the compositions of CRPH that I mentioned earlier. Um, the CRPH, uh, if we uh, initially uh, 15 uh, members are uh, all from NLD, uh, later on uh, two other members of MPs uh, from two separate political parties uh, were you know, uh, uh, joined the CRPH. So there were 17, but still 15 NLD. Um, and I just, I think yesterday uh, they added a few more people. Uh, one from Kachin Party also joined, but two more from NLD joined, I think. So now there are, uh, kind of, I think, 18, uh, 17 NLD and then three from ethnic groups. 
if we look at how NLD won the, the elections, it's 83% of the seats in the Luto. So the fact that NLD will be occupying, dominating 85, 83% uh, of the, the members uh, in CRPH, it still be fine. However, the situation has changed and then the charter itself, the Federal Democracy Charter that uh, CRPH adopted itself also talk, discuss about inclusiveness, diversity and uh, collective leadership and all of this thing. And the body itself does not necessarily reflect uh, the values that the, the body is trying to, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, portray. So this is uh, the second point. Um, if uh, I want to lead to the third point, which is the compositions of the national unity government itself. Uh, if we look at the national unity government, the formation, it's now two lists. The first list has 15 people in it. The second list has, I think, um, 12 more people in it. Altogether, there were 27 of them. The first list, 15 of them, um, if we look at it, only three are non-NLD, right? The vice presidents, uh, the Minister of Federal Union Affairs and the Minister of uh, Natural Resource uh, Management. Uh, only these three are non-NLD, the others, all of them are NLD. If we look at ethnic compositions, uh, I would say, I think another one, uh, Susanna uh, Lalaso, uh, she, uh, she belongs to a Karen, uh, and then uh, the prime minister who himself also belongs to the Karen. So five of them are Karen, uh, five of them are non-Bama ethnic, and then the rest seem to appear to be from our ethnic group. This is the, the, the top leader list, uh, the 15. The diversity that everybody is claiming and welcoming and very happy about does not really necessarily appear in the top list. It's appear in the second list, uh, the deputy ministers. Um, if we look at the deputy ministers, of course, uh, uh, out of 12, I think uh, um, two, only two are NLD and then the other, the rest of the 10, uh, the rest of them are uh, non-NLD ethnic people, um, which uh, we are very happy to see. However, realistically speaking, deputies never really have real power. So if I were SNLD or ANP, why would I want to be part of this if I will only be uh, able to uh, uh, carry out the task, the task of a deputy minister or you know, some other uh, positions? Um, so this is uh, these these are some some issues uh, that are not necessarily reflecting um, the the you know um, the, the the charter itself. In yeah. addition to that, the way the government was formed and its relation to the CRPH is also um, unclear. For example, uh, the foreign minister. Uh, and I, I don't remember the name of the ministry uh, where uh, Ulingolat is, uh, I think the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs, probably. And then the Ministry of um, Defense. Defense Minister, Home Affairs Minister, Foreign Affairs Minister. All three of them are member of the RPH who are supposed to be uh, exercising the, the legislative power and then national unity government who is supposed to be exercising the executive power. and and the basic principle of federalism, as well as basic political science dictate that we need to have clear separation of power, which is clear violation of that principle. And how would that work? Uh, whenever uh, a ministry of, uh, you know, um, how do you say, uh, they are supposed to be checking and balancing each other, not really, you know, like, uh, uh, this is a violation of democratic principle, and it's also violates a, a key federal principle, but, federal democracy is what the charter is all about and what this national unity government is all about. Uh, with this kind of, uh, how would you say, uh, in ambiguity, it's difficult uh, for, I think uh, it would be difficult for uh, a party like SNLD who have stood extremely firmly on the principle of federalism and democracy for the past 20, uh, 30 years. Um, of course, uh, when we talk, discuss about this, uh, some other people might say that uh, because the, uh, you know it's a revolution time, po political expediency, uh, you know all sort of reasons. Uh, maybe we can let this go. Um, maybe we can. Or um, it's possible that we might, and it's possible that we should. 
However, if we keep compromising our principle and our values in the name of expediency and united front, uh, by uh, eventually we're going to we will no longer be standing for anything. We will no longer have any values left. Uh, this is the risk. Uh, these are the reasons uh, um, why you know SNLD. I think uh, I, I do not speak on their behalf. Uh, mm -hmm. If I were them, this is how I would look at the situation, and this is how I I probably uh, decided that I will. Not not be part of it. Thank you, Ying Lao, for your very detailed explanation about the, even though the formation of NUG, NUG seems more inclusive and also more diversified, but there are also some hidden problems that we should not overlook, even though we see alliances between ethnic groups to get joining together to fight against the coup. And for talking about federal democracy, do you, does Alex have anything um, at because you're also a, a member of the NLD as well. I know you're not, you know, talking on behalf of the NLD, but as, you know, uh, indiv individual uh, opinion. There's uh, many issues that we could cover. Um, and uh, certainly even within the NLD, you know, many different opinions and largely divisions have even existed uh, for many, many years. Uh, and because of that, we have also seen uh, the more uh, uh, the, the, those divisions become uh, other parties, you know, namely, uh, even uh, Dr. Dekain used to be a member of the NLD, and now she's a member of the military junta. Um, and so I think um, in, in relation to what uh, has been discussed uh, before, the system within the NLD was never perfect. And we were also in the process of upgrading and changing our own party. Uh, and you know, this is largely not just a party issue, but more of a, a larger national identity issue where there is a lack of uh, proper national identity as, as a Myanmar. What really does it mean to be Myanmar? And even the word Myanmar itself was chosen by a, the first dictator, Une Win's government. And so we've never really had this discussion. And so, you know, we can go down this, this road of, of many, many issues when it comes to ethnics. And certainly I've worked on issues and looked at issues you know, pertaining to uh, ethnic education, to ethnic governance, uh, and the, the, the um, choosing of chief ministers for ethnic uh, regions, especially for Shan uh, and Karen and, and Kachin and et cetera, and Rakhine obviously. And so the um, CRPH as Ying Lao has also correctly pointed out is not uh, just uh, largely NLD dominant. Um, I think it represents also progressive members of the NLD. Let's not forget that for those men, for those first week in, in February, there were, you know, hundreds of parliamentarians locked in uh, one compound and they could have formed a, a bigger CRPH if they wanted to, but they didn't. Um, and so I think it represents the more progressive uh, members of the NLD. Of course, uh, arguably within that CRPH as well, you will have these remnants of um, ignorance, of uh, lack of information and lack of education and lack of expertise in the many, you know, these are 17 members that are now tasked with pretty much leading uh, the next government. And that is a huge leap forward. And that leap forward is a very welcome change for, for many people, I'm sure. But also it's a big demand. It's a big challenge because there's just so many issues that are underlying in Myanmar that need to be changed and addressed at least uh, correctly. And, and a lot of these people, you know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, a challenge of hot potato. Now you have this 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 big uh, task to to uh, to take in front of you. And so, just one of the issues is certainly yes, the issue of ethnic reconciliation and alliances. Uh, you know, really being on board with uh, more practical matters such as who gets to be in power, uh, what the legislative and the executive should look like for sure. Uh, the uh, many questions around federalism, the treatment for our ethnics. You know the perceptions. It's not just the legal, um, the, the the legal standards that are written in, but also the actual practices. You know, we always uh, talk about the legal treatment as equal, but in reality, that has uh, that is large, that is hardly the case. You know, you can just go down 
before when we were applying for passports, for example, or for national ID cards, this is a very occurring, you know, common recurring issue where ethnics who are non-Buddhist especially face even more, uh, even worse treatment uh, than the Bama and Buddhist uh, majority. And so this is one of the issues where in practice, we need really need to make sure that it speaks for itself as well. Um, I, I hope that answers a lot of the questions, but really my point is that, uh, yes, there are so many underlying issues for the new NUG um, to, to overcome, and it will require a lot of uh, growth from them. Yeah, um, and thank you, Alex, for your input. And you're talking about the growth and also the forming the basis for alliances between different ethnic groups. But I want to move a little bit back to when earlier we talked about youth participation, because now we see the new NUG government. And as Ying Lao earlier pointed out, um, you, we have um, the ministers and also the deputies. And when we look at the deputy, as Ying Lao has said, we see more diversity and, and also, uh, frankly speaking, a younger generation of leaders. And so I would like to ask uh, Alex, um, do you, um, what, are, what are the priorities of the resistance movement changing with the formation of um, NUG? And do you think also for the formation of the NUG, is it going to cultivate a second generation of political leaders in the country? I think this coup has already cultivated uh, a second generation of political leaders. I don't think it's necessarily the NUG as such. It is the military that has the, and the oppression that the military puts on us that forces out people to do politics. You understand that even myself, I would much rather do other things than politics, but it is because of the necessity in our, in our country that we have to become activists to protect our own freedoms and, and rights. And so um, the movement uh, and the influence that the youth hopes to put in this uh, is, is really uh, around youth issues. You know, we have been, and I say, when I say we, we, I mean, the youth have been regarded uh, because of uh, cultural uh, norms in the country as a, you know, as, as sort of a, uh, no, we're, we are not welcome in the political environment. You know, the political environment is very much dominated by number one, males, uh, number two, Bamas, and, and three older uh, male Bamas. And so, you know, the age gap is one such issue that we would really like to address as a youth. And what we also see between youth ourselves, between people who are, you know, 35 and younger, <clears throat> we see that that kind of discrimination between ethnics doesn't really, well, it, maybe it will happen, I'm not really sure yet, but uh, at least, you know, we are much more open to having ethnic brothers and sisters join uh, political, uh, you know, fee, political positions. Uh, Ethan Zamao is uh, definitely one of the examples that we have talked about as well. Um, but, you know, we, we really want these youth issues to be addressed um, in the NUG. And some of those issues, like I've said before, is also is underlying. You know, Myanmar has been so busy with other issues of constitution or federalism that we don't have, we, we don't have that much time left to discuss these social or shall I say socio-political issues around women's rights, youth rights, youth empowerment, LGBT rights, etc. And we see that reflected in the protests. One of the first or should I say, um, um, innovative forms of protesting were costume protests uh, in the early days of February. And we saw that, you know, it was largely uh, uh, a dual parallel uh, protest from the LGBT community because they do not have a pride festival because LGBT rights, uh, while a lot of people has been working on it, it hasn't been addressed politically in the political sphere. There has, we have not seen MPs take up that issue very strongly. And it's not that much of a complicated issue that we would like to address much quickly. And so this, uh, this, this movement, and I hope that what the youth, uh, and again, I also do not represent the entire youth, of course, but I can only hope that the aspirations of the youth are for progressive change. You know, we don't want to be, we don't see why we should be waiting so much for people who get elected because we voted for them in the first place. You know, if we voted for them to be in the positions to change the situation to our expectations, 
we really want our voices to be heard. And that is uh, becoming much more apparent in this, in this movement. Thank you, Alex. And what you've just shared, uh, we can also see um, in other countries in the region as well, as you know, we were discussing about Mukti alliances, this kind of um, people, especially younger generation being forced to engage going on the streets, protesting, risking their life. It is, it is not normal. And as, as we've like all realized, there are a lot of changes in Myanmar, things being abnormal, like changes of the internet and people being um, abducted by the military. And there are changes that forces and in a way cultivate the younger generation to be more um, politically engaged. And, and in the response to the military and the coup as well. And um, for the last questions of our panel discussion today, um, before we move on to the q and I, I would like to uh, invite our audience to ask questions in the Q&A box so that we can address those questions later. Um, for the last questions, I would like to ask Kristen, um, because um, as the formation of the NUG, um, how can the following governments recognize NUG and um, what role can NUG play in handling refugee issues for the many who have fled military violence in Myanmar? Kirsten. Okay, so this is an important, well, it's two big questions. And the first one on recognition particularly is a deceptively simple one. So I'm gonna take a bit of time to try and talk through this and the question of how foreign governments can recognize NUG. And actually flip the question about can and how can foreign governments not recognize the military as a legitimate government. So um, I think this is a really important question and a really important issue because we all know that the Security Council is not going to that the chance of any kind of international intervention via the Security Council is extremely remote, that there's going to be blocked by China and or Russia, and therefore this collective action is not likely to be feasible. And so individual states taking action to not recognize the military regime is potentially, I think, a powerful tool. So it's a question that's quite difficult to answer because it's a question of international law and in international law, recognition of states and recognition of governments are considered two separate processes, even though in reality they're clearly related. So the line that's been taken in the UK since 1980 is that the UK and the same position is taken by many other governments. The UK does not recognize governments, it only recognizes states. And you've probably seen this statement um, from our foreign secretary recently. It's, it's the line that's always used. The, the British government does not recognize governments, the British government recognizes states. So the, the idea behind this is supposed to be that we don't pass judgment, we don't signal approval or disapproval of governments elsewhere. We're supposed to sort of have a, um, a neutral approach to political change. And of course, the challenge to that are situations such as Myanmar, where you have this completely unconstitutional, anti-democratic type of regime change. So there are two points I think that are important to consider. And the first is that because we don't have a policy of recognizing governments, that government recognition is supposed to be inferred through dealings with the government. So there is basically this window of opportunity in which governments can kind of refuse to deal with the regime or not recognize the regime or um, and I think there's possibly some although I'm not sure if it's intended in this way some scope for optimism in the United States response so far because we have had the sanctions and the asset freeze and maybe some of you have seen Barack Obama's statement today where he describes the military as illegitimate and he talks about the military as a murderous regime and obviously Barack Obama is no longer in power, but we do know that he's close to Joe Biden. And I wonder if this statement sort of signals some kind of, um, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but possibly we can read something into that in the sense that the United States is kind of um, possibly willing to not um, give immediate recognition to the military. Uh, the second point that I wanted to mention was that even though the British government says we don't recognize governments, we only recognize states, there are actually a couple of very interesting situations where it has refused to recognize a government that took power in a coup. And that was in Haiti in the early 1990s and Sierra Leone in the late 1990s. And in both of these situations, 
um, basically a military coup deposed a democratically elected government and the coup did not have democratic legitimacy and it did not have popular legitimacy. So uh, circumstances that are actually quite analogous, I think, to what we've seen in the coup in Burma. Um, and in both of these scenarios, the British government actually did refuse to recognize the coup regime and continued to recognize the previously elected government. And these are situations that happened in the 1990s after the supposed policy of not recognizing governments, only recognizing states. So I think there's some windows for advocacy here around like the possibility that we don't recognize the military regime that that challenge i suppose this myth about we never recognize governments we only recognize states um and what was the other point i was going to say about that uh kind of related i guess that if we're advocating around this issue we can also think about economic interests because one way in which questions of government recognition often end up being in the spotlight is through commercial law cases interestingly enough because governments enter into contracts they enter into uh, loan arrangements they enter into all sorts of legal arrangements and then when there's a court case in the british courts there may be the question of who is the legitimate government in this country who is the legitimate actor and that's actually when this question of state recognition and government recognition is often has to be dealt with um, and so I think there's an area here where we can think we know that, of course, international commercial investment in Myanmar is now massive and that those kinds of economic arguments are often more effective than the human rights arguments, sadly. Um, so that perhaps if we're thinking about trying to show the kind of vulnerability of commercial investors and the fact that um, a, a, a regime that does not have popular legitimacy, that does not have democratic legitimacy, that does not have effective control of the territory, which is another important criteria in relation to state recognition. We can see that there are protests that are only being kind of, the lid is only being kept on by extreme violence. So this is not effective control. So I think in these ways, there are, there are sort of, there, there are areas for perhaps for advocacy around recognition that might be important. But I think it might be more, effective to challenge non-recognition of the military uh, as the way in perhaps rather than recognition of the NUG at least that's how I read it at this point um, and the other point I was also going to raise on this is that um, part of this question of, of, of recognizing the volatility and the instability is also about whether the military regime is going to be a reliable contractor, a reliable um, partner in international relations. And I think the ASEAN summit is really instructive here because we had the ASEAN consensus statement three days ago, and then we have today immediately a sort of backtracking from the military on the um, arrangements, the points in the consensus plan that were agreed just three days ago. So um, I think perhaps the more that other foreign governments are persuaded that perhaps the, the military is not a safe contracting partner, it becomes a pragmatic question more than a human rights question. So yeah, those are my thoughts on recognition, but it's a, it's a complex issue, but I do think it's a potentially important one and one where there is maybe a window that can be um, at least if, yeah, that we can try to exploit. Um, thank you, Kristen, for your input. So, um, on top of the questions about recognition and not, rec you know, rec not recognizing the military, um, what do you think? What role can the NUG play in handling the refugee issues? Now we have the government, you know, at play. Yeah. Well, I would be interested to hear the other panelists' um, thoughts on this also. But I think first it would be very significant if the NG NUG actually took an interest in refugee issues because. For the last 10 years, refugee issues, I mean, the Rohingya situation is, I think, a slightly different case. Uh, but for the other refugee communities, they've been very much um, in the background. And I actually feel at this point that they're really owed an apology by a lot of the international community, because for years, there's been a huge amount of pressure on refugees in Thailand and Malaysia and India to go back to Burma because conditions had changed and that the situation was stable. And that the refugees' concerns that it wasn't stable were really not being um, kind of given any, any credence at all. So I think it's important firstly to acknowledge that these refugees are still present and that in fact their numbers are now growing and will probably continue to grow unless the situation changes. 
Um, secondly, to stop the pressure for return. And again, even from the ASEAN meeting, um, we see from the chairman's statement that Rohingya repatriation is very prominent in that statement. And I think that's incredibly concerning. Obviously, this is just not the time for repatriation and it can't be until people can return voluntarily in safety and in dignity. Um, so yeah, I think um, removing the pressure to return international donors to reinstate funding, the NUG to work with international donors to actually provide support to the refugee communities. Um, and then the final point, which is also, I think, the most important point, is that refugees themselves really need to be in the forefront of the conversations, because for years, the refugee communities have been asking to be included, they've been asking for dialogue, they've been asking to have some sort of voice in conversations about return and, and refugee policy, and they've really not had that. So I think if the NUG takes the view of trying to work with refugee communities to find out what they need and how they need it, that, that would actually be a huge step forward from what we've seen over the past 10 years. But I would be very interested to hear the other panelists' thoughts. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, um, this is a very interesting point that you raised about the economic interest. It's not just about um, saying no to the military uh, products and the industry, but you, as you mentioned, talking about commercial law cases and these cases usually you know, direct the questions to the jurisdictions and you know who are the sovereignty and and these are the very important points that um we get from what you've just said earlier and um, i would like to know more about the panelists um opinion about the refugees issues as well but we are running a little bit out of time so i would like to move on to the q a session because we have a number of questions and um, first of all, we have a question from Oliver Springer Broginski um, from UEA. Uh, so the question is, can the coup be defeated? <laughs> it's a very general question. And if so, uh, what approaches do you think have best chance? There are only a few uh, divisions as far as we heard. The federal army seems much smaller than the Totemy. Uh, Tamador, uh, the military finances don't seem to be sufficiently weak. Um, does any of the panelists like to start? Sure, maybe I'll take that question because uh, I would like to leave other interesting questions for uh, the panelists. This is a very straightforward question. Uh, my short answer is you're absolutely right, Oliver. The uh, defections, as far as we know, are very, very small, and they we only estimate them to be very small, simply because the brainwashing of the military is very strong. And uh, the inside the military itself, how do you expect underpaid soldiers that are kept in barracks to escape from such high security places where they would be charged with treason and potentially shot? Uh, right on the scene, especially when the military has already started with programs such as uh, asking for a list of family members of soldiers so that they can keep track in case these soldiers defect. And so they already have a very strong um, iron fist control of the on the military by the generals. And this has been the case for many years inside the Myanmar military. Uh, we have also seen the conviction of Myanmar police forces and soldiers on their violence. They actually feel the, you know, we, we see that they, they, they justify their violence against uh, the, these uh, peaceful protesters, even though they are um, uh, committing very horrible crimes and they somehow justify that the protesters are what we call um, troublemakers or, or so in, in Burmese. Um, and you're also absolutely correct that the federal army is much smaller than the Tamador. Of course, it will be smaller. The Tamador is by far one of the largest armies, standing armies in the world, with over uh, 500,000 active soldiers on duty. This is a uh, you know this is certainly bigger than most uh, modern militaries, actually. Um, you know, discounting the global superpowers. Um, and so this is very much a, a strong uh, and a big army, and in and, and a federal army would be absolutely crushed. And even if that was the case, um, the military would be okay with committing very high numbers of atrocities 
uh, and that would legitimize their attacks. The military finances are also not weak at all. They are very strong. The military economy is one of the strongest in, the, in, in Myanmar simply because we have endured uh, decades of military dictatorship and um, uh, Une Win's road to uh, socialism had already paved the way for corruption and many businesses to be led by the military, uh, even though as effective as we can against boycotting them, a lot of the uh, military businesses, not only the ones on paper, but the many, many illegal ones as well, where they are in charge uh, and they are in direct control of many black market and gray markets as well. Uh, but my short answer to how the coup could be defeated uh, and if the Damodog coup can be defeated, absolutely, yes, it can be defeated. And I believe everybody within Myanmar is working and surviving with that mentality, because if we were to accept that they are not to be defeated, um, you know, we, we, we don't know what we would do. But the inacceptance uh, of the Tamadol's control and the belief that we can defeat them leads us to many, many innovative thoughts. And those innovations are lacking in the diplomatic community. As, uh, as Dr. Kirsten has already uh, pointed out before, um, the diplomatic community remains very limited uh, in their options. And that is a very sad time for the world. Uh, you know, when people have to undergo such violence just to protest, uh, you know, what they can do. And we are, the, the Myanmar people have done uh, the best they can against the military coup. And sadly, when I say Myanmar, I definitely also uh, mean the ethnic communities as well, uh, both in Myanmar and who are outside Myanmar as well. Um, but for the coup to be defeated, the international community first needs to come up with things of why can't we do that? You know, yes, we understand that by procedures and laws, you know, this is not the way that, you know, recognition is, is a very uh, complicated task. We understand that. But at the end of the day, laws and practices are just man-made. They're not written by God and they can be changed at any time. And, and I certainly don't believe in a God as a Buddhist. And so um, uh, for the, these approaches to change, I think the uh, mentality for people who are looking to, to help has to be changed. And that mentality, for example, is very present at organizations such as the United Nations. Why, you know, we see that it has become an organization that exists purely to serve the interests. And I mean, the Security Council uh, has become an organization that purely serves the interests of its own members and certainly its own permanent members. You know, and arguably we see that China and Russia are very much uh, self-absorbed and self-interested, and they do not seem to care about the well-being of other nations, especially when Russia attended uh, the, the military parades in Myanmar just, you know, on the days when uh, hundred, you know, dozens had been killed. And so th th this uh, mentality needs to change, and then the international practices needs to change. But once we can achieve that, once the international community decides to stand up against the military dictators of Myanmar, then we can talk about change. But uh, until then, if we do not have that, then unfortunately, the road to defeating this coup will be very, very long and painful. Thank you, Alex. Um, do our other panelists have anything to add on top of what Alex have just said about you know, the, the strategy or the way to defeat the coup? No, um, then I will move on to the next questions. Um, so the uh, next question is about uh, internet access in Myanmar. How, how has the military's move to disrupt internet access impacted the movement's drive to enhance international visibility of what is going on in Myanmar? And how are you adapting to these disruptions? That is also kind of related to what Alex have just said about um, getting the changing the mindset and the international recognition. So, can um, does any of our panelists uh, would like to answer this question about internet um, connection problem? Or does uh, Bobwa or Ying Lao, when you are connecting, you know, when you are trying to communicate with other activists in the country? Um, do you, have you encountered any difficulties in that in relation to um, the communication? Um, uh, yes, um, I think um, 
when it comes to internet, um, it is um, it has become a double-edged uh, sword uh, for 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 a long time, right? Uh, the presence of internet actually um, help us with you know uh, sharing news and you know at the updates and all of this thing at the same time uh the use of internet has also become a, a place for rumors and fake news and uh, hatreds and all, all of this thing i think we have to look at uh, them you know in, in both, both situations um that is not to say that i support the military actions to cut off the internet and and and, and you know all, all of this thing but when it's come to the the, the activists that we are in communication with and we are we are talking with um, it has suddenly become a very big challenge very big problems uh, for us uh, to you know to communicate with them um, even for i think many of the um, even to simply you know conducting some meetings uh, some arrangement it, it has also becoming very difficult and becoming very impossible to you know to be able to access to the internet even some of the internet that are still available for some people uh, the speed has been a lot uh, slower than than usual uh, it's uh, and you know if we have to send a lot of like large files or things like that encrypted messages um, it is a lot more more difficult to be able to do that. It suddenly, uh, uh, you know, have an uh, impact on the, on the, you know, on the movement, on the protest. However, um, like uh, you know, men, I want to echo on what uh, everyone have already said, uh, especially Alex, uh, that the, the the point about how young people have been very innovative. Um, the particularly, you know, the ethnic, uh, the GSEN, General Strike Committee of Nationalities, uh, they have developed this uh, something called federal federal FM. I think they call it federal FM or federalism FM something. Um, so it's a radio station uh, where they broadcast, uh, uh, you know, a FM, a shortwave uh, radio uh, to update all the news uh, that has happening, uh, you know, the key points of the news that are happening over the country. And they have been doing that. Um, they developed that in, in anticipation of the military uh, move uh, to cut off all the internet. Uh, and that has been uh, going on for a while. Um, and, you know, um, and many other uh, channel as well. Um, uh, in addition to that, there are also other channels that people are using, um, which I, I don't really understand. Um, so, yes, the military is trying to do everything to be able to stop us, to be able to make uh, to to make it more difficult for us to organize, to collaborate, you know, to communicate, to do all of this thing. But at the same time, I think uh, cutting the internet also help uh, stop all this fake news and hatred and uh, you know distrust uh, toward e each other. Um, and um, and I think um, for that particular uh, perspective, uh, it is a good thing. No matter what they do, because uh, like Alex says, if we, um, one thing it is really important for us is that we may not have uh, what it takes to defeat, uh, to get rid of the, this military dictatorship right away yet. However, the fact that we are creating a situation where it is ungovernable for the military is already a victory for us and for the people in the country. And I think uh, for the military, it is really important that they are able to govern us. And for us, the fact that they are not able to govern us is already a victory. And, and I I think uh, that all, all, you know, this credit goes to all the people who are protesting and giving their life and risking their life and their freedom uh, to do that and to continue the fight. Uh, even though, you know, um, I think uh, next week uh, we're going to have a global strike, uh, you know, on May second uh, in 15 different countries. Um, that is also something to look forward to, and um, I will definitely be joining one of those protests. Thank you, Yingluo. And I think this question about the internet is quite interesting as well because it is. One of the features that is quite different from previous uh, resistance movement. And also, you can also see how dated the military is in terms of internet and social media and how, how little do they know about how young people actually communicate. And the fact that they cut down the, they cut down the uh, Wi-Fi doesn't mean that people are not able to communicate in and outside of the country. And for that, I would like to move on to the next questions from uh, Phil Ning Chen. Uh, he is a Chief Link Scholar alumnus of the UK from the University of Birmingham. Uh, he has a question. Uh, he has a question uh, for Kirsten. Uh, what are the role of law? What are what? 
What about the rule of law over the impunity of the Burmese military and what aspects of international law can intervene in that aspect? Maybe Christine has already talked about some answer in her talks. I would like to focus on the decades long impunity issues of the Burmese military. Christine. Okay, another um, very big kind of challenging question of international law here. So I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, I, I don't know, I'll start at the beginning, I guess, that you probably know already that international law is based on the principle of sovereignty, which means that every state is entitled to basically um, be independent within its own territory. And this makes it very hard for international justice to come in and, and challenge this question of impunity. So there are two ways through international law that we can provide some kind of um, justice. One is through ideas of state responsibility where there is a dispute between states. And that is the kind of process that's dealt with in the International Court of Justice. So you will know that there's currently Gambia as, as a state has taken the government of Myanmar, the state of Myanmar, before the International Court of Justice on the basis of its um, alleged violations of the Genocide Convention in relation to the Rohingya. So this is the, this is the state responsibility side of international law, and that's what's happening before the International Court of Justice just now. The other international law mechanism that can provide justice is the International Criminal Court. And the International Criminal Court provides individual responsibility. So it's not about the act of the state for which the military obviously is a part, but the International Criminal Court deals with individual responsibility. So it identifies individual perpetrators and they can be prosecuted in the International Criminal Court. Now, the challenge with the International Criminal Court is that in order for the ICC to gain jurisdiction, you must be a state either you must have become a state party to the statute of the International Criminal Court, in which case acts that are committed by your officials or on your territory come within the jurisdiction of the ICC. Now, this is why Bangladesh has been able to take a case to the International Criminal Court on the basis because Bangladesh is a state party to the Rome statute. There is a very narrow window of jurisdiction in relation to what's the, the crime of deportation as a crime against humanity for the mass movement of the Rohingya into Bangladesh. So the basis that this crime was completed in Bangladesh because people were deported from Myanmar to Bangladesh. But the window that Bangladesh has to exercise to, to, um, to bring to life this jurisdiction can only be in relation to crimes that, that have this nexus to Bangladesh. The third way in which the ICC can gain jurisdiction is by a self-referral of a government. Now, obviously, the Myanmar military is not going to refer itself, but perhaps now that we have this ambiguous situation of, of regime ambiguity, perhaps the CRPH could try to. Uh, this is a kind of avenue that would be, um, I don't know, interesting to explore, possible to explore. If they were to say, we are actually the real government of Myanmar and we would like to invoke a referral of the International Criminal Court, then sort of as with the idea, as I said, with state recognition, there's a possibility that you at least prompt a hearing on jurisdiction, that you at least have this question um, raised, you know? So, um, so the, it's a very long answer and it's not a very clear answer in that there is no way in which international law can simply swoop into, there's no police force that can come into Myanmar and arrest the military on behalf of the international community. It simply is, is more complicated than that. And the mechanisms that we have have these very complex ways of, of activating jurisdiction. But there is a small possibility at the moment that I can see with the International Criminal Court and this question of could the CRPH refer Myanmar to the to the International Criminal Court? I don't know. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, we are we are. Um, that is the, our last questions of the Q&A right now, because we are about time to finish um, the discussion. So let me just wrap up our panel discussion really quickly today. Um, thank you very much for Alex, Kristen, Bagua, and Ying Lao to joining us. When we are talking about the resistance, we are um, talking about the youth participation, ethnic groups, and the alliances that is formed in the country and beyond the country. And from this 
different perspectives we can see from the social movement and also the legal perspective that is brought by Kirsten and also the perspective brought by Bua Bua and Ying Lao from ethnic groups and from their experience um, advocacy as well. So I'm really, really grateful for having our panelists to giving us this very diversified discussion in relation to the ongoing resistance in Myanmar and I do believe, I agree with what Alex said, the coup must be defeated because we cannot, for, we cannot tolerate the possibility of it not being able to. And for that, thank you very much for the panelists and for our audience today for joining us. Thank you very much. And I hope that um, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So clear, Yama. So clear, so clear. Thank you all. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye.